good, Swanee. Troy. Troy is going to leave the dance up, the clapping. <laughs> well, I woke up this morning with my mind set on Jesus. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind set on the Lord. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind Yeah. <laughs> 
O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you as a true family of the God who is above all. And Christ Jesus, my Lord, you are our way, our truth, and our life. And we plead, we'll never stop pleading for your way, your truth, your life, to be for our ways, our truth, and our lives, and all that. We plead for your guidance, your leading, you walk in us. That all that we do, all that we say, all that we even give thought to, will be on earth as in heaven. And Heavenly Father, we thank you, thank you. We'll never stop thanking you. Jesus, thy son, life and have the kingdom lives we can now live on earth Christ Jesus we love you love you Lord and all God's children say Amen Amen, amen, amen. And ladies and gentlemen you can take your seats for the next few moments you are beautiful beyond description
announcements for you this morning. <laughs> um, before we call our sister Chris up, who, who has the majority of the announcements, I have a couple announcements to make as well. Um, so this Wednesday night, we are starting the book of Hebrews. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, because it's the first chapter, it's a great time to jump in and join. If you want to uh, uh, join us Wednesday night, five o'clock. We have a meal first, and it's a great meal. And fellowship also is a great time of fellowship. And then we deep dive into the word, and we go line by line by line. And, you know, uh, my wife and I was talking, which we talk all the time about all of you guys. Um, <laughs> you know, we were talking about Sunday service, Wednesday, men's ministry, women's ministry, all the different ministries. And... Um, you know, we were talking about on Sunday when you share the message, what is the, 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 the point of the message? And then Wednesday, what's the point of Wednesday? And, you know, Wednesday and Sunday, two completely different things. You know, Sunday we come, we gather together, we worship, we hear the word, we, uh, we fellowship. But on Sunday, we go line by line, verse by verse. Uh, Okay, you guys, you're listening. You guys are listening. <laughs> very good, very good. That's, that's the first test of the day. Wednesday night, we go line by line. <laughs> scripture by scripture. And uh, it's a totally different experience. Like, uh, And what's so amazing about it as well is that we go line by line. And uh, sometimes we have questions. Sometimes we uh, have things to share. The Holy Spirit put on our heart and we can discuss it. And we really dig deep into it. There's cross-referencing. There's commentary that's involved. So basically what I'm saying is Wednesday night is awesome. And you should be there. Um, but this Wednesday will be the book of Hebrews starting at 5 o'clock. We'll have the meal. And then we will get into the word of God. Um, so two more announcements I have. Uh, and these are personal announcements. But I want to announce it to the church because we are all one body together, one family. The first one is, since we're speaking about Wednesday night, our brother Stan, uh, most, some of you know, most of you know, Wednesday night knows about Buddy, uh, his dog. And so we're asking uh, for anyone, if they, if it's on your heart and if you have had an interaction or an experience with Stan's dog, Buddy, to write a little, a little letter explaining what your experience was with Buddy, a good experience, of course. Uh, so that <laughs> it's always been good, right? Uh, so that we can uh, uh, get it to Stan so that he can get it to the people that he needs to get it to. So come and see me after, see Stan after, if that is on your heart to write a little letter for Stan. Um, the second announcement is our sister Siobhan is raising funds for a trip. Uh, it's, a, it's a school trip, but uh, it's a fundraiser, and it looks like it's pastries. Is it pastries, Siobhan? 
Oh man, you are speaking to my heart here. Okay, I didn't look at it really good, but it's Molokai hot bread, Molokai hot bread, strawberry cream cheese, blueberry and cream cheese, cinnamon and cream cheese, bay cheesecake, mango cream, or just plain hot bread. <laughs> well, there is a sign up sheet, and I'll leave it in the back there that if you guys want to help her out and you guys want to enjoy some good baked goods, which I always do, I'll leave it in the back and you can sign up for that and help our sister Siobhan out. So that's all the announcements that I have. Our sister Chris has, has some for you as well. So thank you, Chris. <laughs> Son? Oh, there we go. Hallelujah. I feel like I said the same thing last week. Okay. <laughs> Never mind me. I'm back there stomping the devil on his head because we're having trouble with the uh, YouTube. Uh, so, don't worry. You're here. Hallelujah. I think they're live up there. So, hallelujah. All right. Uh, Monday, people will be getting together to pray for you. Yes, for you. And you can put your specific prayer request in the bowl back there so that they know. They should just say, like, let them prosper, but let them prosper in what? Right? Heal them from what? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Wednesday Bible study. Jason talked about Bible study. Five o'clock dinner. Yes. Thursday, who left five o'clock? Right here. Friday morning, Yard Ninjas, 8 a.m. Friday evening, Celebrate Recovery, 6 p.m. Yeah. Now, offering child care. Yes, so send your children and you as well. Um, men's ministry is always the third Saturday, so that will be on the 19th of October at 9 a.m. right here. Women's ministry is always the last Saturday. It's only on Zoom, so that's at 8 a.m. on the 26th of October. And uh, the Christmas fair is coming. I didn't wear my Christmas clothes this week, but last week, remember? Um, it is December 7th, which is the first Saturday in December. I think we have about 10 or 11 vendors right now, so plenty of space. If you know someone who would like to be a vendor or if you would like to be a vendor, they just need to uh, email me and then I'll email them back and tell them all the information, uh, which is starting at uh, vendor set up at seven, but the fair starts at eight and it goes until two and there will be food and baked goods and tons of stuff to buy, crafts and fabulous things. So come and shop and fellowship. It's a great time. Um, we are on YouTube Live, by the grace of God. And we are also at newhopevolcano.com. If you have any, you know, want to check things out, read the fabulous blogs every week. They're all posted up there. Um, and we also send out a weekly email. So there's lots of ways that you can also share for other people who might want, might be interested in coming. You might be, hey. Check it out. Check it out. Share it on Facebook. Send it out there. Get it out there in the world. And we will be uh, having some things for you to share on Facebook from or wherever uh, about the Christmas fair coming out soon as well. All glory and honor are his. Mahalo. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, I do have one more announcement, actually. And that is that. You guys can prepare your hearts because youth group Christmas calendars are on the way. That's <laughs> we'll be up, we'll be selling calendars and cards in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, so don't buy any for 2025. We got yours already. We have got yours. All right. So uh, we are about to collect the tithes and the offerings, but before we do so, yeah. Thank you, son. My son is, oh, he's so good. I love this guy. Hey, we forgot one of the main <laughs> things that we do on the first Sunday of the month, and that is we pray for the kids. <laughs> oh, man, Isaiah, you're the best, man. You're the best. Uh, <laughs> so please, let's call all the children.
children of 18 and under to be prayed over by SAC. All right, all right. So that was the second test of the morning. So you guys are one for one, one for one. Not bad. I mean, one for two. One for two. Thank you, love, and everybody for standing in the gap for me there. <clears throat> so we are about to collect the tithes and offerings, but before we do so, uh, uh, there's a couple. Of, there's one thing I want to say, and that's um, Chris has been mentioning about the YouTube this morning. And um, I was blessed with the privilege and honor to go and visit one of our uh, most famous and dedicated and loyal YouTube watchers, and that is uh, Uncle Manny and Auntie Carla on YouTube. So we love you. Let's all say we love you, Uncle Manny and Auntie Carla. We love you. So they were saying that they watch every Sunday um, and, and they don't miss. And they're still, I was able to see their setup. They got their chairs facing the TV. And they felt so blessed. And I felt so blessed because, you know, sometimes we come and we set these things up. And Chris sets up the YouTube. And then our brother Steve helps connect things. And we turn things on. And we try to stream it. But we don't really realize how it's affecting the people at home. You know? And so I was able to sit. And they were able to share with me. And man, it was so exciting, and it was such a blessing, and so grateful. And um, and I say that because you know all of this, we're all tied into this, all of us. Uh, we're all part of this body, and you know, with your ties and your offerings, it allows us to do these things, and set up these things, and offer these things to people who can't come. Um, and I know that many of you, because I see we get about a hundred views a week, are watching it yourselves at home. You know, again. Again, so um, the YouTube ministry, we're going to start calling it because that seems like what it's turning out to be as a YouTube ministry, uh, is thriving, it's doing well, and um, we're so blessed to have it. So if you want to watch the service again, you can check out YouTube. Uh, if you want to give this morning, there's two ways you can give. You can give online at the website, kumokino.com, 
click down the hamburger menu, there is a link that says give online. You can give your tithe or your offering that way. Um, if you're in the building and you want to give, there's an offering bowl by Grandma Susie. You can just drop it into the offering bowl uh, uh, when you have a chance. Now, uh, we say all of that to say, if you're visiting us for the first time, we ask that you please hold back on your money. Be blessed with what the Lord has in store for you this morning. If you're visiting us from another church, we ask that you too, please hold back on your money and take it to your home church. And if this is your home church, we ask that you just please give with a cheerful heart. If we can bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come together this morning to give you thanks, Lord. We thank you for knowing our hearts. We thank you for providing for us, for caring for us, for always knowing what we need, for blessing us, Lord. And sometimes, Lord, for not giving us what we want, because sometimes what we want is not according to your will. But we thank you for your provisions, Father. We thank you for this church that we can come and gather. We thank you for bringing us here safely. We thank you that our lives are in your hands, that no matter what happens, we know that we can lean on you, that we can trust in you. And so this morning with our, our tithes and our offerings, which comes from you, Father, we pray that you multiply it in abundance. We pray that we use it according to your will. And we pray that you use us, you use us to share your gospel message with the community with our friends and our families, with our co-workers. Use us as the vessel, Lord. We thank you so much for all that you do. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. So, good morning. I have been blessed with another opportunity to share the word of God with you, with you this morning. And I'm so excited. This morning we will be continuing on our journey uh, in the book of Revelation and specifically through the seven letters from the, uh, to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Now the last time that I spoke, which was the first Sunday of, or the second Sunday of last month, um, we covered two churches uh, in that message. And I got to be honest with you. That when we went through that message, I felt like there was so much that more that we could have covered. We could have dug a little deeper. Because the truth is that when I did that message and I read from the Bible to you, from those, the letters from those churches, as I was reading it line by line, I was like, oh, this kind of feels like Wednesday night. And I want to just dive into each scripture. And I didn't have the opportunity to do that. But guess what? By taking a look at your notes, we're going to cover some scriptures this morning, <laughs> and we're going to dive deep into the word, and we are going to cover one church this morning, the church in Pergamum. And, um, you know, as each and every day we get closer to the return of our Lord and Savior, we should be preparing our hearts for what is to come, making sure that our lamps are filled with oil to the brim, right? Um, and that is a reference, of course, to this parable spoken by Jesus in Matthew 25 about the ten virgins uh, who took their lamps out to meet the bridegroom, which is Jesus. Five were wise and they took extra oil, and five were foolish and they, they took no oil and they just went out with their lamps. Um, the five wise virgin, virgins were prepared to meet the, the bridegroom. They were prepared, their lamps were filled and they were on watch, waiting for his return. The five foolish ones were not prepared, and they missed his coming. And Jesus said to the foolish, foolish woman, this is not in your notes, but he said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for, for you know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. That is what Jesus said to the five foolish virgins. And remember, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7 that many will say to, to me on that day, uh, and what day is he speaking of? The day of the Lord or judgment day. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, 
have we not prophesied in your name and casted out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. So we definitely do not want to be unprepared. And we certainly do not want to hear from the Lord, I never knew you. So in preparation for his return and his coming, we read the letters written by Jesus to the churches in Asia Minor so that we can see and learn how to prepare not only our church and the churches, but also our hearts for the Lord's return. Now, I got to be honest with you again. I, I'm so excited because I've had so many conversations with many of you about end times, about the book of Revelation, and you guys want to talk about it and you want to get into it. And I love that uh, we're speaking about that. You guys ask questions like, what's the mark of the beast? Who's the Antichrist? Right? What is this one world currency? Those are the questions I get, not only from church members, but from people in the world at my job. They want to know, what's the mark of the beast? You know? And I have my theories, and we can talk about it later if you want to. But... But I love that we're talking about those things because we are looking ahead and we're trying to prepare for what's to come. I, I've also heard murmurs about a revelation study and Bible study coming up. I've heard murmurs about it. It's not set in stone, but be, be prepared for that. But when people outside of the church ask me about revelation and end times, the first thing I always ask them is, are you saved? Because... What good is it to know who the Antichrist is if you're not saved, right? And so instead of worrying about those types of things, I worry more about their salvation. Um, so this morning's message is entitled The Compromising Church. And this is part uh, this is part two in the series. And I cannot say part two of what because we're going to dig so deep in this thing. It could be part two of 20. I'm not exactly sure. But today is the second part so far. And we'll be looking at the church in Pergamum. And I will read to you from Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. The word says this. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You do not renounce your faith in me. Not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold, te hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so that they ate the food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give him some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. So we see here uh, Jesus saying to John, write down this letter to the church in Pergamum. And we know it's Jesus because in chapter 1, verse 16, we read, In his right hand he held the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. So in, in uh, chapter 12 of verse 2, it says, uh, These are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. So we know it's Jesus speaking and the sword signifies judgment on those who attack his people and try to destroy his church revelation chapter 19 later on in verse 15 describes it this way from his mouth comes a sharp sword with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of god the almighty and on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. So when the Bible says, do not seek revenge, for vengeance is his, he 
He means it, right? The battle is his. And as from what we read here in the Bible, the victory is already won. We are in good hands, brothers and sisters. Amen. Okay, back to the letter. So Jesus gives the church a commendation. He gives them a compliment. He gives the church a compliment. Jesus says, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. Okay, so here's a couple of facts about the church in Pergamum. It was a wealthy city in Asia Minor and was a combination of political power and pagan worship. There were, there were temples of Zeus, Athena, Apollo, and others. It also had the throne of Satan there. Pergamum had a very famous library containing 2,000 books and was the headquarters of satanic opposition and a Gentile base for false religion. So we get the idea of what kind of place this was. And Jesus says, I know where you live in this place where Satan lives. Satan, sa satanic things are happening all around this church. <clears throat> and there are many difficult places that one can dwell, that one can live. And I'm not speaking about geographical locations, right? You may not dwell where Satan's throne is, like the church in Pergamum, but you may dwell somewhere where he likes to exploit, right? Maybe you dwell in loneliness, or maybe you dwell in struggling health or an abusive relationship. Maybe you dwell in addiction or idol worship, otherwise known as cell phones. <laughs> but we can also make idols out of children, grandchildren, our spouse, work, we can make idols of those things. And those things Satan can use to exploit in our lives, to draw us away from the Lord. And sometimes we have to dwell in situations longer than, than we would like to. Israel dwelt 400 years down in Egypt before being called out to the promised land. Abraham and Sarah dwelt 25 years in uncertainty, waiting for the promised son. Moses dwelt 40 years out of the limelight down in the wilderness before being called out to redeem God's people. And David was on the run from Saul, dwelling wherever he could for seven years. Yet the Lord had a plan for them all. So, so, so too, Jesus knows where we dwell and has a plan for every extended and even unwanted stay that we encounter on our journey. Just as he does with the church in Pergamum. Now this was, a not, this was not a very conducive place for Christianity to reign. And Jesus gave them this condemnation because they did something well. We read some of the things they did bad, but this is what they did well. Revelation chapter 2 verse 13. Jesus said, you hold fast to my name. Even though all of these things are going on and happening around you, you hold fast to my name. What does it mean to hold fast? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 22 uh, says this. For if you will be careful to do the commandments that I commanded you to do, which is loving your God, walking his, in his ways, and holding fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, uh, the word says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The definition of uh, holding fast or to hold fast is to stick firmly, to hold on to something tightly, uh, to hold on to something firmly, or to remain in the same position, or to keep the same opinion. Okay, so if you are dwelling in loneliness, a difficult relationship, health conditions, persecution from unbelievers, hold fast. Hold fast to the hope that we have. Hold fast to the position and the opinion that we have about our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. There is temptation in the midst of uncertainty and doubt. And the enemy loves to whisper in your ear in times like this, using temptation to pull you away from God. 
And that is why the Bible tells us to hold fast. Hold fast. The church in Pergamum, although surrounded by temptation and sin in the form of idol worship and immorality, they still held fast to the name of Jesus. That is what the church did well. But then we also read that Jesus has something against this church. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13, he says to them, uh, You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Bela to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. Now, Balaam, we read, was a prophet in the Old Testament book of Numbers. Balaam was approached by King Bela, the king of Moab, to curse Israel so that the Moabites could have victory over Israel. And this is where we get that awesome, unique story about the talking donkey. Okay? If you haven't heard that before, you should check it out. Numbers chapter 22. It's pretty cool. Okay, so God uses a donkey to get the attention of his prophet who was going astray. Um, and, you know, I've heard so much stories of God intervening in amazing ways in all of our lives, right? We want to go and do something and God puts a, a roadblock there and we got to turn, right? He never did use a donkey, but he's used other things. Unless you consider me a donkey and I got in your way. <laughs> But that is exactly what the Lord is trying to do when he spoke uh, through Balaam's donkey. Uh, King Balaam offered Balaam riches and honor three separate times. And finally, Balaam agreed to meet with King Balaam. Uh, but as we know, the Lord appeared to Balaam. And, and after going back and forth, Balaam agreed to only speak the words of the Lord. So he went to meet King Balaam, who has bad intentions. He wants Balaam to curse the people of Israel. But an angel of the Lord appeared to Balaam and told him, you only can say the words that the Lord puts in your mouth. So he went and met Balaam. And instead of cursing Israel, he ended up blessing them uh, three different times. And the Bible says that Balaam burned with anger, that he was upset. And it seems as though Balaam was being obedient to the Lord. And for a moment, he was. He did as the Lord said. However, later, we find that Balaam figured out a way to get his reward from Balaam. Balaam advised the Moabites on how to entice the people of Israel with prostitutes and with idolatry. He could not curse Israel directly. So he came up with a plan for Israel to bring a curse upon themselves. Balak followed Balaam's advice and Israel fell into sin, worshiping Baal and committing fornication with Midianite women. And for this, God, God plagued them and 24,000 men died. 24,000 men died. And Jesus says in the letter to Pergamum that some of the people in this church were were. Um, held on to the teaching of Balaam. So they were being stumbling blocks to other people and they were enticing other people in the church. And because of this, the church in Pergamum is known as the compromising church. If you want to write that down in your own, I know that's the title of this morning's message, but that's test number three to see if you're paying attention in the beginning. <laughs> so this church, they were spiritually compromised. In the sense that they worship false idols. And we see this as a common theme throughout the Bible of God's people worshiping false idols instead of the one deserving of worship. And we see that where uh, uh, when the people made, or when Aaron made the uh, golden calf, right? And they went and worshiped the golden calf. They were spiritually compromised and they were morally compromised. In the, same, in the sense that some of them gave in to their sexual desires, participating in orgies that was an act of worship to the pagan gods. So they just let their inhibitions run wild. They did whatever they pleased, whatever felt good to them, they did that. And we see this all too often in our faith sometimes. 
in our churches sometimes that people claim to be followers of Christ, but they are compromised spiritually and morally. And they are compromised in their thinking and in their actions. You know, I had an interaction with somebody very, very recently, like yesterday, where, um, <laughs> where he was struggling with something. And he's someone who's come to church before and, um, you know, he was raised up in the church for a while and then he left. And so now we see him and we're like, how are you doing? And he's like, not so great. And so he shares all of the trials that he's been going to. And they are heavy burdens to carry. They are heavy burdens to carry. And all I could think to say is, you need to press into Jesus. He's the only, he's the only one that can help you through this. If this burden is too heavy for you to carry, you need to press into Jesus. And he said, no, no, I still have faith, but I just believe this, this, and this. And that this, this, and this wasn't what the Bible says. That this, this, and this was what he believed. I still have faith, but I believe that I got to go through these things and I'm going to make mistakes and then I'll get to heaven and then I'll be judged. And so, so Jesus was completely left out of the equation. And I could see him struggling, but I could tell that his, he was compromising spiritually because he was raised in the church. He knows what the Bible says, but he chose to listen to the lie of the world, thinking that he's got to do all these things on his own by himself. He's got to work these things out. We're also compromised, um, not only spiritually, but morally, that sometimes we allow things into our lives that we know that we shouldn't. People compromise morally when they become very critical or judgmental. You know, one thing I've been struggling with in the church lately is that I speak to other Christians, not anybody here in this church, of course, but other Christians. And um, what I'm realizing is that there can be a critical spirit. You know, there is a fine line, but sometimes people can cross the line of being very judgmental and very critical. And I've experienced that. I've shared a little bit of that in a Wednesday night Bible study of somebody I met outside of the church who is so critical of the church, but has never stepped foot in the church, but has all of these ideas about the church, um, but says he loves the Lord, you know? And so we have to be careful that we are not compromising spiritually or morally or in our thinkings or in our actions. And this morning, I wanted to cover in your notes three reasons why people compromise and three dangers of compromising so that we can uh, learn from the letter to the church in Pergamum. So the first reason people compromise is, is number one, is that Satan is good at his job. Satan is good at his job. We're going to go and look at the uh, story of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter three, uh, where the word says, now the serpent, meaning Satan, was more crafty than any beast of the field which, uh, which the Lord God had made. And notice in the story that the serpent didn't tell Eve the true consequences of her actions, right? He didn't tell her, if you eat this, then this will happen. Instead, he made a subtle suggestion, right? He presented her with another option, with a different way to look at things. And he made her believe that God wasn't being honest with her. He made her think that God was lying to her. And sometimes people will try to convince us with their worldly logic to do something that goes against God's word. And we have to be careful of the persuasive people of this world. That is why we should treasure this book. This book should be our most prized possession because not only should we be reading it constantly we should have its words etched on our hearts so that whenever we hear something that doesn't sound right we can filter it through the word of god that we can reference the scripture that was put on our heart so that we can know right from wrong this book is the living word of god this is the thoughts and ideas and the commandments from the creator of the universe this should be our treasure, and this should be uh, our reference to every decision or everything that we hear in the world. And so Satan is good at taking this and twisting this. 
He's very good at that. So we got to be very careful and mindful that we know and we understand what the word of God says so that it is not used against us, which is one of Satan's best weapons against us. So we compromise because Satan is good at tempting us. He's good at persuading us. He's good at lying to us. And the second reason that people compromise is because sometimes we feel that we just know better. I know that the Bible says this, but I'm going to do this because I know this and I understand this. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, the word says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and thought that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate it when the woman saw so she made the decision she saw that the tree was good and it was a delight to her eyes it made her happy she saw the fruit it was good it made her happy and that the tree was desirable to make one wise so she made the decision on her own that she knew better than god god says this but i see this and i desire this so she took the fruit and she made that, that choice for herself and this is a big trap that we can fall victim to and i've been guilty of it plenty times in the past when presenting with uh, with the information we begin to take into consideration our feelings oh our feelings yeah, yeah. our feelings is oh that's a stumbling block in itself our feelings get in the way and our feelings lead us to making bad decisions so many times in our lives we look at how things affect other people and we begin to believe that we are smart enough that we know better that we can make an educated decision i know the bible says this but no one's gonna know i can do this and no one's gonna know and we start to compromise i heard a story once of a young boy who had a paper route and he was about to quit that paper route. that young boy was me i had a paper route <laughs> And I was about to quit that paper route. And I had a paper route once. It was right in the heart of Keao Town. We lived in Keao. I had a bike. I had a bag on the front of the bike. And it was stuffed with newspapers. And I was seven. And I was seven or eighth grade. And it took me about an hour after school to deliver 50 newspapers to the neighborhood. I lived in the neighborhood. Uh, I think I made like $160 a month delivering newspapers in the neighborhood. I was rich, you know, for a, for a seven or eight grader. That was a lot of money. I was buying my friends snacks and candies and baseball cards. And um, once in a while, one or two of my friends from the neighborhood would get on their bikes and they would ride with me as I'm on my route um, giving out newspapers. And then I remember telling one of them that, oh, I think I'm going to give up this paper route because I'm starting to play basketball now. So I want to spend my time after school playing basketball. I'm going to give up the paper route. And one of the conversations uh, led to one of my friends saying to me, oh, before you leave, you should go and make the collections. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but in the, in the olden days, we would go and we'd have to collect the money from the houses as we deliver the newspaper, write them a ticket and give them. And he told me, you should just collect the money before you leave, and then you can have one extra Pay period. And so, <laughs> so I thought to myself, I said, you know, I'm not going to even see some of these people again. So it's fine. So I went ahead and I collected from 15 people on the route. And guess what happened? You know, I can't believe it. I got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the Tribune Herald found out what I did. And they came and they spoke to my dad. And my dad had to pay that money back because I had already bought baseball cards already. So my dad had to pay that back. But my dad took me to each house to apologize for what I did. And so not only shame and, and getting in trouble and, and, and just compromising my, my moral values because of a suggestion that a friend of mine made, I got in trouble. And sometimes someone can fill our heads with ideas. And they may sound like good ideas at the surface, and sometimes it take, all it takes is a little seed to be planted in our mind and in our hearts. And then sometimes we nurture that little seed, 
and we water that seed and then we convince ourselves that that's a good idea and the problem is that if that seed is not lined up with the word of god and we continue to nurture it that seed will produce a tree that will produce bad fruit and i think we all have eaten bad fruit before and that's because of wrong thinking and wrong ideas <laughs> And we nurture those wrong, that wrong thinking and wrong. The book of Proverbs says this, uh, chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that appears right to man, but in the end it leads to death. I cannot tell you how many times this scripture has pierced me in the heart. And I cannot tell you how thankful I am that I have a wife like Stacy, Because I, how many times I've made decisions that I thought was good ideas. And I really, truly thought they were good ideas. But then my wife comes and says, that's not a good idea. And, and, and we'll go back and forth sometimes. Only to find out in the end that she saved me from a lot of trouble. She saved me from losing money. She saved me from getting in trouble at work. You know, um, There is a way that appears right to us that we think is right. But in the end, it leads to death. And that's why we have to be careful in the way of thinking that we know better than God, that we are going to make the decisions based on what we think and what we feel. And instead, we look to God to see how we handle every situation in our life because we can easily be tempted to compromise our values. The third reason that people sometimes compromise is because, number three, it's easier to go with the flow. It's easier to go with the flow. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So we see that Eve saw that the fruit was good. We know that she ate the fruit. She gave it also to her husband. And what did he do? He ate the fruit too. Now, I don't know. I've heard many different takes and perspectives about Adam eating the fruit after his wife. But the fact of the matter is that God gave a command. And he commanded Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, whether he did so because his wife did it or whether he did so because he didn't want her to be alone in her transgression or whether he did so out of direct disobedience, she offered it and he accepted it. It's hard sometimes to go against the grain and there can be a lot of complications with that. A lot of division, disagreements, arguments, hurt feelings. <clears throat> All of those things can be a result of not compromising and holding fast to your moral values. When you hold fast to the word of God, there will be arguments. There will be disagreements. There will be people not agreeing with you. You're going to have tough conversations. You're going to be put in difficult, uncomfortable situations. But the word says that we should hold fast. And sometimes we compromise because holding fast is too difficult for us to do and so we compromise on little things it's easier to just go with the flow and we say ah, it's not worth my time it's not worth my breath to say anything and we let things slide a little bit <clears throat> the extent and the extreme of the things that we compromise may vary but no matter how big or small those things are if it's left unchecked or unresolved it will cause the enemy to get a foothold in our lives and I love Happy's illustration when he was up here maybe last month where he said even if you have a little crack in the door the enemy will put his foot in there and we know that to be true that the enemy will put his foot in there and he will slide right in <clears throat> so that was a perfect illustration you know uh, my family and I are far from perfect but one of the things that we do is we absolutely positively do not watch rated R movies or inappropriate movies. If you do, I'm not judging you. I'm saying we don't do that. We, we do other things that you might say, why are you doing that, Pastor? I don't know. But we don't watch R-rated movies because we know that there can be inappropriate language, that there can be um, uh, inappropriate sexual things, that there can be violence and horror and all those things. We check every single movie that we watch on uh, on an app that tells us everything that's in the movie that's inappropriate so i have friends and i have had friends that say hey did you see this new movie blah 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 and and 90 percent of the time i say no i haven't 
And they say, you should watch it. And I say, and they know already. I say, can I watch it? And they know exactly what I mean because I will not compromise allowing those things in, in my house and in my mind and in my son's mind. So we cannot compromise on that because I'm afraid that if I leave a little crack in the door, if I leave a little crack in the door and I allow my son to hear or see something that he shouldn't see, that the enemy will come right in and he will corrupt corrupt our, our values. Now, here's a here's a interesting thing. You guys can help me out after church. Come and see me if you have some advice for me, okay? My son, angel from the Lord, <laughs> um, so sweet and so innocent. He's learning things in school from the students that I'm trying to hide from him. He's telling me things that he shouldn't be hearing. So we've gotten to the point where I have to make a decision as a father. Like I need to have a talk with him about certain things so that he doesn't learn it from his classmates. But we get to the point here where this is the compromise. What am I going to do? Am I going to have this talk and reveal some things to him that he doesn't know about, but he's hearing it from his father who loves him? Or am I going to not say anything and continue to think that I'm protecting him and allow his classmates to tell him things that he shouldn't be hearing at his age, right? So we're faced with these things every day in our lives. You know, that's just a couple of things that I face in my life, the compromises that I have to make. And the Bible says that I need to hold fast to the word of God. So come and talk to me, but I think I'm going to have a talk with him. Anyway, so those are just some of the reasons why people compromise that we should be aware of, that we should uh, make sure when we're making decisions that we're not compromising on our faith and our morals. Now, there's dangers to compromise. Like we just spoke about, you leave a crack and the enemy will come in. But I put three dangers in your notes, other dangers to look out for. The first one is that uh, when we compromise, we sometimes can believe the lie, right? Genesis chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Now, we know that some people in the church of Pergamum uh, were believers, and we know that because Jesus says to them, repent, and those who overcome. So there is uh, people. there are people there who are believers that he's asking to repent and to overcome, and he says that they will receive the rewards. So some are believers who attend the church, but they have believed the lie. They attend the church, they hear the word, but they believe the lie of the enemy. And believing the lie is so dangerous, just like in the Garden of Eden, the enemy will question you and he will question your morals. And he'll tell you things like, it's okay to have a couple of drinks and drive. You're not that drunk. Or he can be um, even more subtle than that and he can say, ah, it's okay you didn't read your Bible this week. You already know what's in that book. You read every, every letter of that book. Or it's okay that you haven't prayed. God knows your heart. He knows your heart. You don't have to pray. Those are the little lies that the enemy says to us. The subtle suggestions, so small, <clears throat> uh, that those are the lies that try to make us comfortable with compromising our morals and our faith. And it's super dangerous to believe the lies. They'll say two things to us like, you're not worthy. God can't use you. How can he use you? Look at all of the things that you do in your life. Or God hasn't healed you yet because you don't have enough faith. Or how do you even know that you're saved? Look at look at all the bad things that you do. Those are the little lies that the enemy says. And if you believe them, it'll make you doubt your faith in God. And if you believe the lies, it will lead you to number two. Um, when we compromise, the danger of that is that compromising leads to sin. Genesis chapter 3 verse 13. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? What have you done? And after hearing all the wonderful lies that the serpent had offered to Eve, she decided that she knew better than God. And she decided that it was worth it to compromise her relationship with God to be equals with God so that she could see what God sees. And it caused her to sin by disobeying God. 
what is this you have done? Haven't I given you everything you needed and even more? And that was not enough. And this is the same exact question we ask ourselves when we compromise our morals and we end up in the ditch. We ask ourselves, we make a decision that sounds right to us. And then when we face the consequences of our sins, we say to ourselves, what have I done? What have I done? God, what have I done? And sometimes we believe the lies of the enemies and we compromise our marriages and it ends in divorce. Sometimes we listen to the lies of the enemy and we compromise our jobs and we become unemployed. Sometimes we listen to the lies and we, com and we compromise our friendships, arguing over politics because we want to be right and we lose lifelong friends. We compromise our relationship with the Lord and we put our prayer time and our Bible study time on the back burner. We put other things ahead of God because we allow ourselves to be distracted and misled and we believe the lies of the enemy and we find ourselves compromised. And that compromise, number three, separates us from God. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So he, God, drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed an angel and a flaming sword that turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Sin displeases God. And in our sin, we feel totally separated from God. Jesus said to those that follow the teaching of Balaam that if they do not repent, he will wage war against them with the sword of his mouth, with the power of his word. In our sin, in our compromise, we are separated from God. And Jesus calls for these people to repent and to turn away from the sins that they are committing. Revelation chapter 2 verse 16 says, Therefore repent or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of the mouth. Jesus says he will wage war with the sword of his mouth. And it's been interpreted that the sword of his mouth is his word. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirits of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intention of the heart. God's word is the sword. So if there's any compromise in our lives, let us repent, turn away from it, and seek the Lord for counsel. Pray for forgiveness. Ask the Lord to give us the strength to be bold and courageous, to hold fast, and to stand firm on God's word. That's the lesson that we learn from the church in Pergamum, to hold fast and stand firm on the name of Jesus. Jesus says that he who does this, or he who overcomes, will receive from Jesus some of the hidden manna, and he will give us a white stone and a new name that will be written on the stone. A name that no one knows except for the one who receives it. Just as Israel received manna, God promises to give true believers the spiritual bread that the unbelieving world cannot see. The bread of life, Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. John chapter 6, verse 51. The word says, I am the living bread, Jesus, that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Amen. And the white stone with a new name written on it signifies the idea of when an athlete wins uh, the games, whether it's Olympic games or whatever games, he's often given as part of his prize a white stone, which is the admission pass to the winner's circle or the winner's celebration uh, afterwards. This may signify the moment when the overcomer will receive his or her ticket to the eternal victory celebration in heaven. And much like Abram had his name changed to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah and Jacob to Israel and Simon to Peter, we will have new names written on our victory pass. A name so intimate that only Jesus and you will know it. And I'm kind of glad, I'm kind of looking forward to my new name and seeing what it is. 
I've always been so so about Jason. You know, I've been so so. When I was younger, I liked it. My friends all called me Jay. But now that I'm older, I'm distinguished. I go by Jason. <laughs> my middle name, however, you might not know, is Kalani, which means the heaven. My, my parents were in the head. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to hearing my heavenly name. Now, when we get there, so we're all going to have two names, two bodies. I think I shared with you before that Stacy and I have a secret password when we get up there that we're going to know, we're going to say. That's not true, but it's a little joke we had, you know. Um, so this morning, I want to encourage you. I want to close by encouraging you to hold fast to the word of God. Hold fast. Do not compromise on the morals that God placed on our heart. And I feel like there's no time more appropriate than right now to share one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible, not in your notes, because I didn't want you guys to get ahead of me. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. <laughs> Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. I hope that I come up here every Sunday and say it, and it gets etched on your hearts. It says, do not conform to the ways of this world. Do not be like this world. Do not compromise. Do not give in. But instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We no longer think like the world. We no longer act like the world. We transform our mind according to the Bible. Then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Who doesn't want to do that? We want to test and approve God's will for our life because his will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Amen. So do not conform or be like or compromise to the Instead, have your lives fully transformed by the renewing of your mind through the word of God. Amen. If we can bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. Your word that is alive and active and it speaks to us. It speaks to us. And it's so amazing because it speaks to us in a new way. When you are ready to reveal to us whatever it is you want us to know from your word. And we thank you that we can read these letters to the seven churches. And there's so much meat there. There's so much to take away. There's so much to learn from. There's so much to, to know. There's so much to uh, guard from. So that we don't fall into some of these temptations or traps that, that some of these churches are falling into. But we look for the things that you approve of, Lord. We look for the things that bring glory to you. And we want to do those things. We want to apply those things to our lives. So this morning, as we read through your word, to hold fast, to not compromise. We pray that you give us the strength to be bold in that. That wherever we go, whatever situation we are faced with, that we do not compromise, Lord. That we hold fast. To your name. Congregation, we have reached the point in the service where we'd like to offer those who have not had a relationship with Christ Jesus and are looking to begin one to do exactly that this morning. To ask Jesus to come into your life, to be the leader of your life. The book of Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so we want to offer that opportunity this morning to those who do not have a relationship, to confess with your mouth, to say this prayer, and to ask Jesus to come into your life. I want to ask everyone else to say the prayer as well so that it can be an edification for those who are saying it for the first time, so that we can do it in unity as one body to encourage those are seeking to have a relationship with Jesus this morning. So if you can, please repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I've done lots of things on my own. I have not always asked for your help or your advice. I want to change that now. This morning, I recognize you as my forgiver and I want to follow you as my leader come into my life 
And as best as I know how, for as long as I know how, I will follow you. So now I say it so that you can hear me, so that I can hear me, so that my neighbor can hear me, and the devil can hear me. Jesus Christ is my Lord. I will follow him and him alone. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me first. Father, I thank you for those who have said that prayer for the first time. I thank you that you have entrusted us with the spreading of the gospel of good news. I pray that you can uh, continue to lead us and guide us through your word so that we can offer our testimony, that we can share your word with those around us, those that we love, uh, and those in our community. We thank you for blessing us with this church building here that we can come and gather. We thank you for the food that's been provided and all the hands that have helped uh, prepare it for us. We thank you for the time of fellowship we're about to share. We love you, O oh Lord. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. And we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you. 